The thing about door knocking and why it's so important is because it's something that knocks on the door. I actually think that I've had a much greater impact on the world in a positive way since leaving any pursuit for a particular office. Uh, so do I think I could do it? Sure. I guess I've just gotten to the point in my life where um, I don't really do anything because I think I should. I do stuff because I think it's important and because it's what I want to do. And I would just say, I think we need in all respects in our leadership and in public life, it would be great if we had people who had dealt with their stuff. If you're leading an, on an office of four people or if you're leading a state, it doesn't matter. If you deal with your stuff, you're probably in a better position to lead. Good afternoon and welcome to the Capehart Podcast on Washington Post Live. I am Jonathan Capehart, Associate Editor at the Washington Post. Jason Kander was a rising star in the Democratic Party. The Afghanistan war veteran won statewide office in Missouri in 2012, launched a U.S. Senate bid by 2016. There was even exploration of a presidential bid. And then he left the scene. In his new book, Invisible Storm, a soldier's memoir of politics and PTSD, Kander opens up about his struggle with his mental health, his quest to address it and be a beacon for others. And joining me now is Jason Kander. Jason, welcome to Washington Capehart on Washington Post Live. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. I appreciate it. I'm a fan, and uh, we have the Metzl family in common uh, of Kansas oh. City. I know you've done some. I mean, there's like all these. We, that, we could do a whole show on how many great Metzls there are running around the world, but I know you've worked <laughs> with one of them, and uh, so I've heard great things about you as well as being a fan. So I'm, I'm pleased to be with you. Oh, well, well, thank you. And the great Jonathan Metzl, and he's not just great because we share for first name. Jason, we have a, a lot to cover, um, but I wanna start with your military service. Um, you served in Afghanistan as, a, as an intelligence officer. What was going on in the war at that point and what exactly was your role? Sure, so uh, I got there in October of 06. So at that point, uh, which was a long time ago now. And so the going theory of the war at that point was that uh, unlike Iraq, where the conversation was about winning hearts and minds, the overall feeling in Afghanistan was more that the hearts and minds had been won in the sense that the vast majority of the population wanted to see the coalition led by the United States uh, succeed. The issue was winning the confidence of the people and, and making people really believe that they could invest in the idea that the government of Afghanistan was going to be successful and not, you know, that the idea that uh, supporting the government of Afghanistan, supporting the coalition was not going to get you killed with Taliban reprisal. And so a big part of that was making sure that that government of Afghanistan could be competent and wasn't overly corrupt. I say overly because, frankly, there was a certain level of corruption that was just baked in uh, to the, the work of running the country of Afghanistan, I suppose, and has been for a long time. My role when I got there, I, the role that I ended up in was uh, one of internal stability. And there's a bunch of fancy terms for what I did. But basically, I was an intelligence officer who was tasked with going out and developing information, collecting intelligence about the level of corruption and the nature of corruption of the people that we were dealing with. So the general in charge of U.S. forces, the ambassador, you know, subordinate commanders all the way down the chain of command, they were dealing with uh, members of the Afghan government, whether they be military or, you know, ministers or whatever, and they needed to know what their extracurricular activities were. In some cases, they were involved in narco trafficking. In other cases, they were, you know, double dealing with the Taliban or al-Qaeda. So it was my job uh, to go out with my translator and as my boss at the time, uh, my colonel put it, uh, conduct thug intelligence, which was a made up term to mean go develop relationships with uh, thugs, with potential bad guys, so that they will give us information about other bad guys so that we can know really who we were dealing with. And, and just to put an even finer point on it, because you write later on in the book, just for anyone who thinks that an intelligence officer 
um, is just somebody in an office. Your clinical social worker impressed upon you that your work was just as dangerous as the frontline soldiers who were out there with other soldiers. She, she said to you, you write, your meetings in Afghanistan, on the other hand, meant you and your translator went out more or less alone with no backup, no one even knowing where you were, totally vulnerable for hours at a time in the most dangerous place on earth to sit with people who might want to kill you. When I read that line, I mean, that to me, totally put into perspective the work you were doing over there in Afghanistan. So you got there in, in 2006. When did you come back? Uh, I came back in early February of 2007. So that was another thing for me is I was only there four months. So the story I then proceeded to tell myself when I came home was, look, I did one tour. It was four months and I never fired my weapon. So that can't possibly be traumatic. That's what I was telling myself for a very long time. And so then when you returned then, what was your adjustment like? Like you said, you were only there for four months, um, not over several tours of duty, as even by 2006, we had heard um, about soldiers going through that. So then what was your initial adjustment like when you got home? Well, I, it was abrupt. Um, you know, I was what's called an individual augmentee, which is to say, I didn't go over with like a, a full unit where we went over and then we came back together, right? I had volunteered to go. And so I was accepted to go fill a, a spot, like a, a slot that needed to be filled for you know the period of time it needed to be filled. And so as a result, like when I came home, I came home just me and I was in civilian life, you know, in the army, I was an intelligence officer in civilian life. I was a brand new lawyer right out of law school. So I, I came back home uh, and I went and I like, signed some paperwork saying, okay, I'm, I'm leaving active duty. I drove up to Fort Leavenworth uh, here in, in the Kansas City area. And then within two weeks, I was back at my desk at my law firm in Kansas City. And, you know, there was nobody that I was, that I was hanging out with on a daily basis who had served. Uh, and it was, I didn't realize it at the time, it was a pretty isolating and abrupt experience. Um, at the time, I, you know, I thought, well, I'm home now. Like I should just go back to how things were. And I and I I really should just be happy that I'm home. But meanwhile, I was beginning to struggle with some things that were minor. Like I had like a twitch in my left eyelid that had started as soon as I actually landed in Qatar, leaving Afghanistan. And that lasted for about six months. And I started to have some nightmares. I really struggled with getting in a vehicle at first. I got better at that because I just did it so much. But I, I would get into a into a car and my heart would start racing. But even then, I knew what that was. I was like, okay, every time for the last few months that I've gotten in a vehicle, I've been preparing myself mentally to take a life or to be in a fight. And so I was able to understand that at the time, but a lot of other stuff I, I was dismissive of. So then what got you into, so you, you, you just said you come back and you're a brand new lawyer at a law firm. At what point did the, the, the political bug bite you and um, you ran for a statewide office, Secretary of State, which at the time in 2012, nobody knew really what that job was. Right. Thanks to Donald Trump, we now know that it's one of the most important statewide elected um, officials in any given state. So what made you want to run for that statewide, statewide office? Well, first I got to back up a little because I, I don't want to uh -huh. give myself too much credit as if, you know, every politician likes to have this origin story that, you know, I was never going to run for office, but then this thing happened and I was just caught. No, like I was a political science nerd. Like I went to school in D.C. and I, I knew I wanted to be in politics. I just didn't know what that meant, really. But I had started I had my designs on a state house seat before I deployed. And when I came home, um, you know, it wasn't very long. It was a few months before I got actually actively into running for it. Um, but then I served two terms in the state house. And, you know, that was the beginning of me really chasing what I now realize was, you know, one, I was trying to do good things for my state and my community, but also some sense of redemption for feeling I hadn't done enough uh, in Afghanistan. And then I go to run for uh, secretary of state. And like you said, people didn't know what the heck the secretary of state was. I remember talking to people who would say, so you're going to be in charge of like foreign relations. And I always <laughs> would joke that, yeah, like, I'm just going to keep the peace with Iowa. And, you know, <laughs> that's my job. And, um, but so I ran and I was uh, I was 31, I think, when I was elected secretary of state. 
And it was, you know, I was the first millennial ever elected to an American statewide office. And a big part of it was explaining to people what the Secretary of State did. Like that campaign ended up being in 2012, really just about photo ID, because that's what the Republicans wanted to make the campaign about. And at that time, because people weren't as familiar with these issues, you know, I opposed the idea of having a photo ID law, but I, I had to contend with the fact that the majority of Democrats thought that you should have to have a photo ID in order to vote at that time. And so there was a lot of, uh, in that campaign, the thing that is the last thing you ever want to have to do in politics, which is educating. You know, they say, once you're explaining, you're losing, but we were able to take it head on and kind of go on offense on the issue and, and just barely win in what is obviously a, a tough state for a, a young progressive from, from an urban area. I'm going to speed through your your um, electoral success. So you, you win the race, and now you are getting uh, national attention. Um, now you are um, running for Senate. And I want to boil down your entire Senate campaign into one ad. But I want to show folks this spectacularly memorable ad you did for your 2016 Senate campaign. I'm Jason Kander. And Senator Blunt has been attacking me on guns. Well, in the Army, I learned how to use and respect my rifle. In Afghanistan, I volunteer to be an extra gun in a convoy of unarmored SUVs. And in the state legislature, I supported Second Amendment rights. I also believe in background checks so that terrorists can't get their hands on one of these. I approve this message because I'd like to see Senator Blunt do this. I mean, that, and now folks know why I call that a spectacularly memorable ad. Um, out of, of your Senate campaign, you did, not, you did not win that race, but you, got, you did better than Hillary Clinton um, in her presidential campaign in, in, in your state. And I'm just wondering, what was happening inside um, as all this newfound fame and attention and expectation began to take shape. I also forgot to mention um, that you met with President Barack Obama in, in that time. What was going on inside you as the nation was starting to get to know you and clamor for you? Uh, yeah, it, it was, um, the, the analogy I use is that it was like, you know, emerging from the, from a bunker after nuclear anni nuclear annihilation, like you know, my party had just been pretty well wiped out in the 2016 election, and I had lost my race. And it was like coming out of the bunker with a few survivors and taking some weird solace in the idea that the other survivors seem to be turning to you and being like, "I think maybe you're in charge." We're not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and because what had happened was, as, as you mentioned, you know, I had outperformed the top of the ticket by about 16 points which meant that there were like over 100,000 uh, voters who had voted for Donald Trump and voted for me on the same day. And it's not like I had run as if I was a pretend Republican or something. Like I, I had, you know, I'm a progressive. And, and so a lot of people were like, okay, how did you do that? And, and President Obama was saying nice things, eventually invited me out, as you said, and we had a conversation where he was encouraging about the idea of my running for president, which by that point, you know, in early 2018, I was very much thinking I was going to do. And what was going on inside is that, you know, trauma doesn't get better with, with age. It's not like wine, it just gets worse. And so now at this point, I've gone from having uh, night terrors every night to having night terrors every night, all night. And I, my other symptoms are getting worse. Like what I now know is referred to as hypervigilance, which is to say, I felt like I and my family were in danger. Uh, all the time. And I was, it, it was exhausting. I was constantly trying to thwart and prevent and control threats, control situations, uh, and a lot of threats that weren't real threats, but that they were very real to me. Um, I had become a father was one, in that time. Jason, it, it, actually, to that point about threats that weren't really threats, you write about one situation at a gas station when you and your family were you know, out, for, uh, out for a drive and your wife, Diana, and your son, True, were inside the little convenience store and a young guy approaches you with a gas can and finish the story. Yeah, and in my mind, uh, and this is the kind of thing that happened all the time, I just kind of chose that example in the book to illustrate it. 
in my mind, this was a trap. It was, you know, this was a dangerous situation and I needed to take immediate action. So I went inside and I was very abrupt with my wife and I was like, and she was like, well, we're going to the bathroom. I was like, no, we're getting in the car right now. And we got out of there and it was after 45 minutes or so that she convinces me that it probably was just a guy who'd run out of gas. Uh, but that's mm -hmm. not how my brain worked for all those years. It was every time something bad didn't happen, in my mind, we had just averted a close call. Because um, what I later learned in therapy is that my brain got stuck in that simpler combat environment and didn't really trust the idea that I was out of danger. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, I had gone from a world where for those four months I had learned always know where the exits are, face them if you can, know how many people there are between you and your vehicle, know everything you can about the people in this room and be prepared to you know, start shooting if you're gonna need to do that to get yourself out. Um, so that I got to the point where if anything was out of place, if I didn't have control over something, my brain couldn't triage that between, hey, you, know, you left the light on when you left the house and there's someone in the house and they're here to kill you. Mm. And so that while you're, pursuing the presidency is is pretty exhausting uh to be uh -huh. you know just try, playing whack-a-mole with your emotions all the time which is what i was doing i was using my very ambitious and very active career to avoid myself you know you you um write in your book for those of you who have the book it's page 139 and it's the very first sentence where he writes where jason writes you have to be a little crazy to be in politics but what you cannot be is mentally ill. And you go on to um, write about you know, all the emotions that you were feeling, your wife was feeling. And Jason, one of the really powerful things you do in your book is that you give space. You don't write about what your wife Diana was thinking or feeling. You give her room in the book. It's in italics, it's italicized, and it's just marked Diana. And we get to hear from her, her feelings and her thoughts at the time con concurrent with what you're writing about in the book. Why did you feel it was important to give not only Diana space, but to have her voice be a part of your book? Yeah, I appreciate you asking about that, Jonathan, because uh, that's those are my favorite passages in the book. Um, I did it for a few reasons. I'd say we did it for a few reasons. We really created this together. Um, one, I'm not the only best-selling author in my family. My wife is as well. Uh, so she's, she's, she's very good at this, and, and I wanted her voice to be in there. That's, that's one reason. Uh, another reason is, and I'm sort of building in importance, right? The second most important reason would be that one of the important devices in the book that I used in writing it that was very difficult was I tried to, as I was writing it chronologically, to return myself, to return to my mindset at the time. Because what I didn't want to do was I didn't wanna avail myself of the language that I gained in therapy before we're at the point in the story where I'm in therapy. I want to, uh, I want to relate what was going on with me using only the knowledge that I had at the time. And the reason mm -hmm. for that is one, I think it allows the reader to go on the journey with you, but two, I, I wanted people who were reading the book who maybe hadn't had treatment before but might need it or suspected they did or knew someone who was going through some similar things and wanted to understand them. If I talked about it in terms of things like hypervigilance, well, that's not, you can't relate to that. But if I explain, look, the world is a very dangerous place and there's danger around me. Well, someone might connect with that who wouldn't otherwise. But the shortcoming of that is that you're only getting the perspective of someone whose perspective is a bit warped, right? And so mm -hmm. it's important to have another narrator who could come in and say, well, here's what I was observing in Jason at the time. Here's what was changing about him from what I was seeing. And then the last reason is, and this is the most important, is when I went to therapy, I learned, and then Diana learned, uh, about post, uh, a secondary post-traumatic stress, mm. which we had not known was a thing. But Diana had been experiencing anxiety. She'd been experiencing s some of my symptoms despite not having my underlying trauma, not having gone to Afghanistan with me. And we wanted to make sure that people were clued in about that much earlier than we ever were so that they could also be on the lookout for it and understand that we went through that journey together. What's the reason I think I, I love it so much in addition that those passages, in addition to the fact that I love my wife and I think she's brilliant and funny and amazing is that it ends up coming out in the book as really it's a love story throughout the book. It really ends up 
being a story of, of our marriage and of getting through this difficult time. Right. And, and in a lot of her passages, I mean, she's not, she doesn't hold back in terms of writing about, you know, the terror that she felt and the concern that she, that she felt. And I'm glad you brought up um, secondary PTSD because I was going to ask you about that. But so how do you, how do you treat that? What is, what is your, your treatment like? And is anyone ever cured of PTSD? Yeah. Um, well, let's, those are both great questions. Let me take them in reverse. Uh, you're not, you don't get cured of PTSD. Uh, it's an important, important point. And the reason for that is simply that PTSD is an injury that's based on memories. And if you don't wipe away the memory, then you're not going to cure PTSD. However, it's just, it's an injury and, it, and it's no different than any other injury. You know, um, I talk about in the book early on about getting a really bad knee injury and having to have surgery in order to go into the army. So I went through surgery, I went through physical therapy. Well, I compare PTSD to my knee injury. You know, I, I, I had that surgery all those years ago. I still, my knee still hurts sometimes, but I, I can run. Um, and I'm actually a pretty decent runner. But I know that like, I'm gonna ice it. I know that like my knee feels better if I run on the like, uh, you know, the nice cushy track near our house as opposed to just running on the road. But, but I can run. And PTSD is a similar thing. It is an injury to the brain. You go through therapy to deal with the underlying trauma, and then you learn how to manage it. it. It's little things like when my mind wants to tell me like something hypervigilant, like, no, true, my son has to wear a helmet whenever he's on his little foot scooter, I'm able to go, wait a minute. He really doesn't need to. He needs to wear one when he rides his bike. That's hypervigilance. That's PTSD. I'm able to go, okay, I know what that is, right? If I'm, if I'm going through a stressful period, and I start to have some nightmares. I know, oh, you know what I've been do doing during the day? I didn't know this before, but now I know, oh, I've, I've been avoiding these thoughts and intrusive memories from Afghanistan or some other issue. I need to go ahead and embrace it. I need to go ahead and read some news articles about it. I need to stop and think about it during the day so that my subconscious won't decide to deal with it at night because I've been avoiding it. And then I don't have the nightmares. For Diana, you know, her, her treatment, she ended up doing a slightly different kind of therapy. But basically, you know, you treat PTSD the way you treat PTSD. I mean, she went through what was basically talk therapy. She also did this thing, somatic experience therapy. There's just different kinds and different people respond to different kinds of therapy. But the, the thing about post about secondary post-traumatic stress is it's PTSD. It's just without the underlying trauma. And so a lot of the th treatment really is very similar. And so you went and got treatment through through the VA, but it was uh, labyrinthian. I don't know if, even know if that is a word, but you went to the, the Veterans Community Project, which you toured as, as a candidate. And then I think it was like six weeks after you ended, um, I think it was your mayoral campaign, you went there seeking, seeking help. Talk about the Veterans uh, Community Project and why I think I think I read either in the book or maybe it was in the intro video um, that your work your work there has been maybe even more fulfilling than your elected office or even running for even higher office. Yeah, no, I really appreciate you asking about this. Um, it's actually my royalties from the book go to the Veterans Community Project. So any opportunity to talk about it is uh, something I really appreciate. So uh, Veterans Community Project, VCP, uh, was started by a, a handful of combat veterans in Kansas City. This is prior to my coming along, um, who said, you know what, we can do, we can, we can save people from falling through some of these cracks of the VA system. Now, I want to pause here and footnote this to say, like, I try not to say anything that's going to discourage people from going to the VA. I went to the VA. I get all of my medical care from the VA now. It's an outstanding experience. Now, with that said, we can all acknowledge that sometimes getting into the VA and getting the process started can be uh, difficult. And that's not the people, the fault of the people at the VA. That's some stuff that's happened in Washington. But with that said, uh, the, the folks at Veterans Community Project said, hey, what if we could do anything for our fellow vets? And they said, OK, what if we had a walk in center that any vet who came in, we could deal with any issue that is confronting them and we didn't have to worry about you know, what was their discharge status? How long did they serve? All these different questions and the chutes and ladders thing that the VA is required to do by the laws that have been set up by Congress. And so they opened that and they were treating thousands of vets a year and making a huge difference. 
then the other piece and what we're much better known for is they said, well, what if we were to attack veterans homelessness in a way that just made a lot of sense? And what they did is they created a village of tiny houses with wraparound case management services and basically recreated base housing to put people back in their most recent stable and successful uh, place where they were in their life and then restarted the military to civilian transition back at day one. And so whereas most transitional housing for homelessness programs, if they can reach like a 40 percent rate of getting people transitioned back into the community and permanent housing, that's considered really good. BCP operates at an unprecedented 85 percent success mm. rate of doing that. And so I got involved because I was finding that despite, you know, having a lot of connections and that kind of thing, that I, I wasn't sure how to get because the thing is, when you first go to the VA, oftentimes, particularly if it's for mental health, you're not in the best place to navigate a difficult system. And I wasn't. Right. And so I called VCP, who I just toured six weeks earlier. They said, come on down. I went through the outreach center, no different than any of the thousands of Kansas City vets who had done the same. They helped me with my paperwork. And a week later, I got my first therapy appointment at the VA instead of you know months, which is what it was looking like it was going to be. And then I started hanging around. I had created a national organization before. They'd been so successful in Kansas City that communities around the country were reaching out and saying, hey, can you do it here? I was kind of giving some advice to the co-founders on that. And finally, they were like, hey, man, you seem to be doing pretty well with therapy. You're not working. <laughs> You're here a lot. You want to just come down <laughs> and work full time? And I did. So for the last three years, I've been the president of National Expansion. Uh, in that time, we have expanded our operations into the Denver area, the St. Louis area, Sioux Falls area in South Dakota. And then we've now just purchased property in Oklahoma City. We're going to start building there. And then we've got a couple other cities coming soon. Jason, we, we are basically out of time, but I got to get you on one, one more thing before I let you go. Also, I learned from reading your book in terms of BCP and the, the, the basically the village that they set up um, for, for veterans, I learned that one of the reasons, or probably the primary reason, um, homeless veterans don't go into shelters is because of it not comfortable sleeping around strangers, which helped help me to understand why, um, when you look at homeless population, a lot of veterans make up that homeless population. So that was a, an incredible thing for me to learn. But I got to get you on one more thing, and that is the issue of masculinity. And you discuss conceptions of modern masculinity and how they can complicate efforts to seek mental health treatment. I'm bringing this up because Senator Josh Hawley has a book coming out on masculinity next year in 2023. It's not out yet, but he seems to have made modern masculinity and its apparent collapse uh, an, an integral campaign of his. At the National Co uh, Conservative Conference, he blamed the left for their mental health problems, joblessness, joblessness obsession with video games, and hours spent w watching porn. He says, the crisis of American men is a crisis for the American Republic. Now, in light of the viral video of Senator Hawley running from the rioters on January 6th, I was wondering if you could speak to his conception of masculinity and what he might be missing from it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I actually learned that this book is coming out this morning. And my first thought was, uh, this is like me writing a cookbook. I mean, it's like, <laughs> I don't know how to cook. Uh, so look, um, I make fun of it. It's easy to make fun of it. Here's what I think is really important to understand about this, is that Josh Hawley, for as devious of a person as he is, and he is the most devious, uh, he's also very smart. And this is what Josh Hawley is doing. He is positioning himself and therefore his movement, his far right white guy movement, as if you're a man, then you believe in these things, this lack of tolerance. You, you believe in these things. He's positioning. It's a very smart thing to do. He is positioning his political beliefs, which woven within them and, and hidden underneath very careful, delicate wrapping is you know, opposing working people getting a decent wage, opposing working people being able to organize, opposing women having any, any autonomy over their own body, and all sorts of things. What he's doing is he's positioning that as masculine, which is complete BS, but it's also very smart. And so I want to say, you know, how, I, look, this is ridiculous, but it is also extremely effective. And so we have to take this very seriously. We cannot be dismissive of this. What we have to do is we have to offer an alternative 
and more, I think, helpful version of what masculinity is. Masculinity is not being exclusive. Masculinity is not telling people that we sit in judgment of them. And this is a real problem for Josh Hawley, because Josh Hawley wants two different groups when he eventually runs for president, which I think he thinks is like already started. He wants two different groups. He wants people two generations up from him and I, and, and he wants those people to look at him and say, now there's a nice young man who understands that what a man does is he gets married and he doesn't smoke pot or whatever the heck he's talking about and, mm -hmm. and he doesn't play video games. He wants those voters. But Josh Hawley also wants people who watch the UFC and who have a friend who, who acknowledges they've had an abortion and, ha and work with a gay person who they happen to really like. But you know what? They also, like, they're white dudes. And they feel, because they've been told over and over and over again that there's not a place for them the way that there used to be, he wants to get both of those people. And mm. we have to make that appropriately difficult for Josh Hawley to do because we have to make it clear that what Josh Hawley is talking about is not masculinity, it's intolerance, and it's judgment of them and their way of life, which is a much more tolerant, even though it doesn't seem like it, it is compared to the first group that he's going after, a much more live and let live group of people. Wow, an incredible message to end this already overtime interview on. Jason Kander, author of Invisible Storm, A Soldier's Memoir of Politics and PTSD. Thank you so much for coming to Capehart on Washington Post Live. Thank you, Jonathan. I appreciate it very much. And thank you for joining us. To check out what interviews we have coming up, go to WashingtonPostLive.com. Once again, I'm Jonathan Capehart, Associate Editor at The Washington Post. Thanks for watching Capehart on Washington Post Live.